Well, welcome everyone to uh, the final colloquium of our fall series at the Center for Global Ethics and Politics. We're excited today to be uh, addressing uh, uh, questions of practical urgency um, concerning uh, the title for today's talk is Fighting for Worker-Driven Social Responsibility, a new model for realizing labor rights in globalized supply chains. And we're honored to have here um, as our speaker and also a translator and coworker uh, in the network, um, Lupe, Lupe Gonzalo, welcome. She's a staff member of the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. Ms. Gonzalo is a farm worker herself with over 12 years of experience working in the fields of Florida. As part of the Fair Food Program, Ms. Gonzalo and her colleagues conduct worker-to-worker -worker education sessions on human rights in the fields on all farms participating in the program. Ms. Gonzalo's work at the CIW, Coalition of Immokalee Workers, includes hosting daily radio shows on their low power community FM radio station, leading the women's, the women's weekly group meetings, receiving complaints of abuses in the fields, managing wage theft claims, and investigating cases of sexual violence and modern day slavery. Finally, Ms. Gonzalo represents the CIW at a national level, speaking publicly on the challenges faced by farm workers in Florida. Our translator, Rafaela Rodriguez, is the Director of Partnerships at the Worker Driven Social Responsibility Network. Prior to jo joining their staff, she worked for over seven years in various national and international settings as an advocate, working alongside human trafficking survivors, migrants, and undocumented communities. In 2016, she supported the implementation of the second national WSR program in the dairy industry in Vermont and New York. She helped develop the Milk with Dignity Standards Council, the third party monitor responsible for implementation of the Milk with Dignity program, bringing dignified living conditions to farm workers. Rafaela is a graduate of the University of California at Berkeley and obtained her master's degree in social welfare at the Luskin School of Public Affairs at UCLA. Finally, and last but not least, we have our own doctoral student, Patricia Cipolliti. She's a doctoral student in the uh, philosophy program at the Graduate Center. Her recent research draws on feminist, critical, and decolonial theory to investigate the possibilities and limits of solidarity. Broadly, she's interested in understanding the current social order and what it means to prefigure alternatives within it. Prior to embarking in graduate study, Patricia organized with faith communities as a national coordinator with the Alliance for Fair Food, the partner organization of, Immok of the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. She holds an undergraduate degree from Georgetown University and a BPhil degree from the University of Oxford. And her role today will be to frame the discussion that will follow in terms of relating it to um, more theoretical concerns that we've been thinking about here at the, at, in the program and at the Graduate Center and at our Center for Global Ethics and Politics at the Ralph Bunch Institute. Concerns about solidarity and organizing and uh, ways of achieving serious and lasting social change. And I'm really delighted to uh, welcome our speaker and, and um, to also to credit Patricia for organizing this, uh, this more practically oriented colloquium, which I think is really very important and I'm sure will be watched uh, by many people um, who watch our recordings. So with that said, I'm going to pass this. I wanted to say that we are going to be uh, doing something uh, special for us, which is uh, offering simultaneous translation for the first time. And after Patricia gives her talk, uh, then uh, Rafaela will um, help us figure out how to use that system. Uh, it's, it's really quite simple for, uh, for attendees. So Patricia. Perfect, thank you so much, Carol. And thank you all for being here. Um, it's really, 
a treat, I think, to be able to welcome Lupe, with whom I worked for several years in Immokalee, um, and Rafaela as well, um, colleagues in this work. Um, it's something unconventional, I know, for a philosophical community, but I think that there's so much richness to the CIW's experience, and um, I kind of wanted to open by connecting what Lupe is going to be talking about with some of the themes that we explore in our philosophical communities. Um, just some of the reflections that I've had um, that have been prompted by my thinking um, alongside the CIW over the years. Um, of course, the what what is going to be presented is philosophically rich in so many dimensions, and I'm merely going to present some of those dimensions now. Um, so, first of all, um, I want to say that Lupe is going to tell the story of how the CIW came up. So CIW is the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. That's the name of the organization. Um, they came up with this model they call worker-driven social responsibility to secure the rights of farm workers in a growing number of U.S. farms. The approach is not one that was developed from the armchair or from the desk of a well-meaning nonprofit, corporate, or government leader. As we'll learn, the CIW gets started as a group of workers, displaced from a number of countries and speaking various languages, who find themselves inserted into the brutal history of agricultural labor in the US. Facing low wages, backbreaking work and violence, they decide to organize across their differences for better conditions. Over time and through struggle, um, failure, trial and error, they learn a number of things. Among them, that their direct bosses don't hold the economic leverage necessary to make change. This is the bosses at the farms where they work. Rather, it is the corporations that purchase from the farms where they work that should be targeted. They're the ones that hold the, the power in the situation. In other words, the CIW strategy is based on an analysis of market power, of relations of economic domination that they've generated over time from their distinct position in the supply chain. Their list of demands, their analysis of what needs to change, is also grounded in their direct experience with multiple interacting structures of injustice. Lupe, for example, has been on the forefront of fighting the dynamics that make farm worker women disproportionately vulnerable to sexual violence. Theories of situated knowledge, social ontology, and intersectionality may certainly be brought to bear here. And in turn, the CIW's account, and of course, those of other movements and organizations, can help us critique and improve these theories so that they're more reflective of experience. On one hand, the CIW's market analysis marks fast food chains, supermarket companies, and food service providers as campaign targets. On the other, it identifies consumers as necessary allies in the pursuit of change. Building solidarity, not only among farm workers, but also between workers and consumers of all stripes and with other uh, socially and economically marginalized groups has been a fundamental ingredient of the CIW's success. Questions about the priority of solidarity to justice, about different types of political coalition and about how to practice solidarity come into view. For instance, we can think with the CIW about the significance of deference. Um, of the idea that we should follow the lead of the oppressed and the limits of this disposition in certain, certain circumstances, such as when farm workers engage dairy workers in connecting their struggles across industries. Lastly, and perhaps most generally, I think the CIW can help us think about social transformation. One promising way to articulate social transformation is through the idea of prefigurative politics, a way of relating to each other ourselves and the social world that seeks to build the new world in the shell of the old, to quote the international workers of the world. The CIW has always sought to transform relations of power in the workplace and in the broader supply chain. The WSR or worker driven social responsibility model that they have developed puts workers in the driver's seat. Workers develop the code of conduct, educate other workers about the rights they have, and monitor compliance in conjunction with a third party monitoring body set up by workers. We may object and say that this is far from the emancipatory horizon of say Marxism or even a vision of economic democracy and worker ownership. Nevertheless, I think the CAW's experience challenges us as philosophers in the armchair um, about to think about our aims of the world that we're trying to build and how 
from the point of view of those who suffer injustice and navigate myriad obstacles to organizing. We can learn a lot by attending to what a group like the CIW sees as strategic points of intervention, what they consider to be priorities, how they navigate asymmetric power in building coalitions with allies and with fellow workers, and how they relate um, in an ecosystem to other approaches to justice, from traditional unions to worker-owned co-ops to feminist and anti-racist movements. On that note, I want to pass the mic on to Lupe to tell us about the Coalition of Immokalee Workers and its approach to farm worker justice. And just before I do that, I want to invite Rafaela to tell us a little bit about how to manage the interpretation. Okay, so now Rafaela is in the, in the interpretation room. And we can pass it off to Lupe to tell us about the worker-driven social responsibility model. Thank you. Podemos empezar. Lupe, gracias por venir y estar aquí. Gracias. Perfecto. Bueno, pues antes que nada, gracias por la oportunidad y el espacio. Y mi nombre es Lupe Gonzalo y yo soy parte del staff de la coalición de trabajadores en Imocali. Y bueno, pues la coalición es una organización que es dirigida por los trabajadores y estamos basados en Imocali, Florida. Somos trabajadores que venimos de diferentes países como Guatemala, México, Haití y otros eh, países centroamericanos. Eh, los trabajadores empezamos a organizarnos alrededor de los años 90. Eh, juntándonos en un cuarto de una iglesia aquí en Imocali, pues para reflexionar sobre los problemas que los trabajadores se enfrentaban en ese momento. Eh, los trabajadores se enfrentaban problemas de robo de salario, eh, pobreza. Eh, muchas veces trabajadores no tenían el derecho de tomar descansos. Eh, los abusos que trabajadores se enfrentaban también era como la violencia verbal, la violencia física y en casos pues más extremos, eh, mujeres que se habían enfrentado al acoso y asalto sexual y en la esclavitud moderna. Entonces, viendo todos estos abusos, los trabajadores empezaron a hacer diferentes reuniones, y en esas reuniones se eh, hacía mucho lo que es la edu educación popular, en donde se mostraban dibujos, se reflexionaba sobre los dibujos, se veían videos, porque pues muchos trabajadores en la comunidad pues hablan diferentes idiomas, eh, muchos trabajadores eh, no tuvieron pues acceso a, a la escuela, entonces... Eh, había una necesidad de poder usar eh, una manera de organizar en que todos entendían el problema y que todos iban a luchar para solucionar ese problema. Entonces, alrededor de esos años hubieron diferentes acciones aquí en Imocali. Uh, hubo un paro laboral en la que los trabajadores pues decidieron no ir a trabajar ¿Verdad? Para mostrar pues la, la, lo que es importante un trabajador. Eh, también eh, hubo un, una marcha contra la violencia cuando un trabajador fue golpeado brutalmente por el simple hecho de querer tomar agua. Y también pues una huelga de hambre que duró 30 días por parte de seis trabajadores y todas estas acciones se estaban haciendo con el fin, ¿verdad?, de hacer un cambio dentro de la industria, que no existieran más abusos y que los trabajadores fueran tratados como seres humanos. Entonces, los trabajadores, pues, hicieron estas acciones para tener o llegar a un acuerdo con los rancheros. Pero, pues, la respuesta de los rancheros nunca fue sentarse con los trabajadores o escuchar lo que los trabajadores estaban pidiendo. Entonces, durante ese tiempo, varios medios locales llegaban para cubrir las noticias de la lucha de los trabajadores. Eh, un reportero se acercó a uno de los rancheros para preguntarle por qué no te sientas con los trabajadores, por qué no escuchas lo que ellos están pidiendo. 
Y el ranchero pues le respondió, déjame ponerlo de esta manera. Un tractor a mí no me va a decir cómo yo voy a manejar mi rancho. Entonces era básicamente la respuesta de los rancheros que no veían a los trabajadores como seres humanos, simplemente estaban viendo al trabajador como una máquina de producción, ¿verdad? Que no tenía necesidad de tomar descansos o que no tenía necesidad de, de tomar agua, ¿verdad? Entonces los trabajadores no aceptaron esa respuesta. Los trabajadores dijeron, pues no somos tractores, somos seres humanos. Y sabían que no iban a llegar a ningún acuerdo con los rancheros. Por eso los trabajadores empezaron a buscar otras estrategias de cómo traer el poder para hacer esos cambios dentro de la industria. Y por eso los trabajadores en el 2001 empezaron la campaña con Taco Bell, que pues es una corporación de comida rápida bastante grande y que pues compraba muchos tomates en los ranchos donde los trabajadores eh, estábamos trabajando, ¿verdad? Y pues los trabajadores empezaron a enfocar eh, esta lucha para atraer a corporaciones como Taco Bell y por primera vez los trabajadores salieron de Imocali para ir a través del país a exigir justicia, a exigir respeto. Pero también llevaban tres demandas que era bien importante para que eh, estos cambios realmente pasaran. Una de ellas es que Taco Bell pagara un centavo más por cada libra de tomate que ellos compraban y que ese dinero fuera distribuido directamente a los trabajadores en una forma de bono. La segunda demanda es que Taco Bell firmara un código de conducta que fue creada por los mismos trabajadores, en la cual estábamos pidiendo derechos básicos, ¿no? Tener agua, tener descansos, eh, tener baños limpios, pero también se incluía cero tolerancia para el acoso y asalto sexual y cero tolerancia para la esclavitud moderna. Y la tercera demanda es que los trabajadores tuviéramos una voz dentro del lugar de trabajo, eh, que pudiéramos reportar los abusos sin miedo a ser despedidos o que los patrones tomaran represalias contra nosotros los trabajadores. Porque eso pasaba antes, ¿no? Que si uno ponía una queja, te despedían del trabajo. Pero eh, para poder lograr traer a estas corporaciones, eh, teníamos que buscar alianzas, quiénes eran los que iban a apoyar la lucha de los trabajadores y pues esos aliados pues son los consumidores, ¿verdad? Los que comen cada día los productos que nosotros cosechamos, ¿verdad? Y esa conexión que existe entre trabajador y consumidor. Los consumidores muchas veces no saben de dónde vienen sus productos, muchas veces no saben cuáles son las condiciones que un trabajador enfrenta para poder llevar comida hasta la mesa del consumidor. Por eso eh, se empezó a ir a las diferentes universidades, se empezó a hacer eh, presentaciones como la que estamos haciendo ahorita para que los consumidores eh, pudieran ver eh, qué es lo que uno enfrenta como trabajador. Entonces, eh, en ese tiempo con, con Taco Bell, pues se hicieron marchas en las universidades, se hicieron protestas, se hicieron huelga de hambre y también se empezó un boicot en la que pues los estudiantes empezaron a dirigir este boicot exigiendo a las universidades que cortaran los contratos que tenían con Taco Bell o si no, eh, si no firmaban ellos este acuerdo con los trabajadores. Entonces después de cuatro años de lucha y este boicot, pues Taco Bell firmó en los acuerdos con, con los trabajadores. Fue la primera victoria que tuvimos y fue una victoria bastante grande para nosotros como trabajadores, ¿verdad? Pero también importante la participación de los consumidores en esta lucha. Y bueno, después de esta, de esta victoria con Taco Bell, seguimos la, la campaña con otras cadenas de comida rápida, con otros proveedores de comida, otros supermercados, 
Y ahorita pues tenemos 14 corporaciones que ya han firmado y ustedes pueden verlo ahí en la imagen. Esas son las corporaciones que ahorita están dentro del acuerdo por comida justa. Y en el 2010, después de que algunas corporaciones habían firmado, pues también eh, se unieron lo, el 90% de los rancheros que producen tomate en Florida y pues llegaron a acuerdo también con los trabajadores. Y en el 2011, pues empezó lo que es el programa de comida justa. Y el programa de comida justa lo que significa es que ahora hacemos sesiones de educación de trabajador a trabajador. Vamos a los ranchos para hablar con los trabajadores. Y como pueden ver en la imagen, los trabajadores se reúnen en un área con sombra, con sillas, y podemos hablar de cuáles son sus derechos, cómo los trabajadores pueden reportar los abusos que, que existían y que ahora ya no tienen que seguir aguantando cuando está pasando algún problema en el lugar de trabajo. Entonces, por primera vez, los trabajadores tenemos el derecho a tomar descansos, tenemos acceso a sombra, a agua limpia para tomar, las mujeres por primera vez eh, tenemos el derecho de trabajar libre del acoso sexual. Ya no tenemos que aguantar, ya no tenemos que agachar la cabeza. Ahora podemos reportarlo y nadie nos va a despedir por eh, poner una queja. Entonces, eh, por ahorita, eh, básicamente los trabajadores pueden reportar los abusos, cualquier tipo de abuso sin miedo. Y nadie va a enojarse con los trabajadores o va a despedirlos por poner una queja. Entonces, ahorita básicamente con este programa nuestra dignidad y nuestra humanidad están protegidos. Entonces, eh, eso es en cuanto al programa, pero vamos a hablar un poquito más de eso. Ahorita vamos a ver un video para que Rafaela puede tomar un descansito y continuamos. ¿Todo bien, Rafa? No se escucha el sonido. If you want, I can share my screen and play the video. Okay. Give me a second. Can you hear the music? No, just you. Um, does anyone know how to make sure that the music is heard? Rafaela, how did you do it before? I'll take her off. Uh, she wants to um, take her off as a uh, translator. I'm going to end language. I ended language interpretation. Okay. okay. So basically, you need to go with you when you stop sharing. And then when you start sharing, you know how you pick what screen you're sharing. Yes. It'll say at the bottom, you have to look carefully, sh share audio. Share sound. Got it. Yes. Okay. Done, done. Thank you. Durante la pandemia, la coalición una vez más tuvo que tomar acción viendo la urgencia y la necesidad en nuestra comunidad de Imocali. Como trabajadores esenciales, no teníamos la oportunidad de quedarnos en casa, no teníamos la oportunidad de un hospital si nos enfermábamos o el chance de hacer cuarentena. Se distribuyeron más de 40 mil mascarillas aquí en la comunidad. También empezamos una campaña para traer recursos como pruebas. 
También trabajamos con otros grupos como Médicos Sin Fronteras para que ayudaran a la comunidad, socios en la salud que también están ayudando mucho en estos momentos. Se han logrado traer o vacunar más de 6,000 trabajadores en Imocali y hemos hecho bastante trabajo para que la comunidad pues, sepa que las vacunas es un recurso en que va a poder ayudarles a que esta pandemia no les siga afectando. Pegamos volantes por toda la comunidad en diferentes idiomas, hicimos dibujos y mucha educación popular para que los trabajadores nos protegiéramos y animar a nuestra comunidad a hacerse las pruebas y ponerse las vacunas. También usamos nuestra radio comunitaria haciendo entrevistas con doctores y promotores en salud y anuncios del CDC para que nuestra comunidad esté informado y no dar prioridad a los mitos. Uno de los derechos principales que se asegura con el programa es el derecho a la salud. Gracias a esa sociedad que hemos creado con los trabajadores, hemos podido asegurar que estén cuidados en la labor. Han implementado mucho lo que es el sistema de salud, han limpiado voces, han desinfectado las áreas de lonche, han asegurado también que ningún trabajador eh, pierda su trabajo por el simple hecho de, de haber salido positivo del COVID-19. El COVID todavía no termina. Seguimos batallando para asegurar la salud y brindar más protecciones a los trabajadores agrícolas. Por eso es importante que ustedes nos apoyen, que se conviertan en donadores mensuales, porque eso es lo que va a garantizar que el trabajador siga poniendo la comida en la mesa. Si usted dona cada mes, nosotros seguiremos haciendo este gran trabajo para ayudar a la comunidad, así que únase a este programa de sostenedores. All right, perfect. Ahora podemos regresar a la presentación. Creo que ya está todo bien, Lupe, puedes seguir. Ah, pero la pantalla. Okay. Y bueno, pues eh, este es un poco sobre el trabajo eh, con COVID que hemos hecho en la comunidad, ya que pues eh, estamos enfrentando esta pandemia que ha sido muy difícil para los trabajadores agrícolas, ya que son trabajadores esenciales, pero no con los recursos necesarios para proteger a uh, su salud. Y como había mencionado anteriormente, también pues eh, lo que es el programa, eh, como parte de, de, del programa de comida justa, también se creó eh, un, un consejo que es un tercer partido. Y es un elemento importante en el programa porque el consejo es independiente y ellos eh, van a los ranchos y hacen entrevista al 50% de los trabajadores que están en el rancho. Aparte de eso, también se creó el, el, la línea de quejas que es 24 horas, 7 días de la semana y que está accesible en diferentes idiomas como lo es el español, el creol, inglés y algunos otros idiomas indígenas que se hablan aquí en la comunidad. Entonces eso es muy importante también de que eh, cuando, una, cuando un trabajador llama al consejo es una persona real que está respondiendo el teléfono, ¿verdad? No es una máquina y que puede responder en un idioma que el trabajador se siente cómodo y que puede hablar con esa persona sobre los problemas que está enfrentando. Entonces eso es bastante importante dentro del de programa de Comida Justa. Y bueno, pues tenemos el impacto que se ha tenido, ¿verdad? Eh, ahorita pueden ver en la imagen eh, los números que es un reporte que el consejo hace cada año y especifica bastante claro lo que es el programa y cómo ha tenido impacto bastante fuerte en los trabajadores. Entonces, por ejemplo, podemos ver que los trabajadores están recibiendo el bono, el centavo que las corporaciones dejan. Cuando las corporaciones compran su tomate, ellos dejan un centavo. 
y después el rancho va a distribuir ese centavo a los trabajadores en su cheque en una línea aparte, dice programa por comida justa. Entonces, depende cuántas corporaciones compran en un rancho y cuánto es la producción que el trabajador hace, así va a recibir un bono, pero trabajadores han recibido entre 20, 50 o hasta 100 dólares, ¿verdad? Entonces, este reporte está disponible al público también. Si ustedes quieren visitar la página del consejo, pues eh, se puede compartir la información para que ustedes vean pues, más en detalle lo que es el programa. Y por supuesto, la expansión. Y ahorita voy a dar el espacio a mi compañera este, Rafaela, ¿verdad? Para que hable un poquito más sobre lo que es la expansión y también lo que es eh, WSR. Carol, I think now you end interpretation so we can have Rafaela present her piece. I can't hear you, Carol. Great, yes. Uh, and now, Carol, you can put Patti in the interpretation and she's going to be interpreting English to Spanish. Lupe, ahora, ahora que van a poner la interpretación es cuando tú te metes a que Patti te te eh, interprete lo que yo estoy diciendo, ¿va? You're on mute, Carol. Uh, should I take you out as an interpreter or? Um... I mean, it doesn't matter as long as you assign Patty. It doesn't matter where I am. Just say like assign Patty as an interpreter. Okay, one minute. <laughs> okay, I think that's done. Uh, do you see it as a, an option for yourself? Let's I don't see. yet, no. Mm. Oh, it doesn't give me. Uh, mm. Oh, I see. I didn't put in Spanish. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's my first time on this one. This is our learning curve. Okay, I'm I'm there. No, because you're assigning me. It says welcome. You have been assigned as an interpreter. That's why I have to take you out. Okay, yeah. then take me out. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then you add her, add Patti to it. Oh, is it is it working now? Yes. Lupe, escuchas a Patti? Patti has un sí. Okay. All right. Um, let me share my screen one more time. Uh, let's see here. How to do all of this in a tiny computer? Um. Okay, I'm sharing the screen and I actually had some notes that, hmm, it would have been better if Patti could share the presentation, but maybe that's a little too late because I do have notes that I want to look at so I can't go full presentation mode. Um, let's see, what would be ideal? Oh, I know what I can do. Let's present. <laughs> um, I can look at my notes in on my phone. Uh -huh. Okay. So, you know, as you heard, well, first of all, yes, the expansion. Um, the expansion of the program has means that, you know, this model is working not only in Florida and tomatoes, but beyond Florida. Um, you can see on the map that it's expanded. Um, up north, um, two different states, two different crops. And one of the most critical expansions is that um, that expansion that you see in blue in Vermont. And the reason why that's critical, it's because it has expanded to a different um, sort of industry. It's still agriculture, but it's in the dairy industry. And so workers up in Vermont uh, from a group called Migrant Justice did a series of exchanges with the coalition of Immokalee workers where you know they they 
came down to Immokalee, saw the fair food program working and decided this is the solution we want for the abuses we're facing in Vermont in the dairy industry, even if it if the abuses are different. Um, they saw the benefits of the program and the, the critical components of the, po the program as something that they wanted to implement. Um, this is a video. That's okay. We can skip that video. <laughs> so why WSR? Um, why this model? As, as you heard from Lupa's story, this model was informed by the day-to-day -day experiences of workers, not only in the fields, but also in their initial actions to try to bring change to their conditions. Some of the realities that informed that decision to create their model are things as, you know, the reality that although the NLRA, I, I don't know how familiar you all, you all are with that, but is meant to give the right to workers to collective bargain, aka unionize. There are currently actually, though, 27 states who have banned such agreements with quote unquote right to work laws. So that means that in those 27 states, workers cannot legally unionize, even if they want to. Secondly, there is the issue of exemptions to all kinds of labor rights for farm workers, uh, such as exemptions from minimum wage, uh, such as exemptions from being able to be inspected by OSHA, depending on the number of workers in the workplace. A lot of states, you know, when we talk about minimum wage, that means that a worker can only earn federal minimum wage, not the state minimum wage. And that's a specific, uh, you know, law pertaining to farm workers, right? Saying farm workers, let's say, for example, in Vermont, are allowed to make the federal minimum wage, but not the state minimum wage. Every other worker in Vermont can make the Vermont state minimum wage. I just want you to think about, you know, the root of these of these type of laws, right? Where where did agriculture come from in this country? Who used to work those fields? These are still exemptions and, and putting farm workers in a category that is different than every other worker in our country. Um, the OSHA uh, reference that I made around inspections, depending on the number. Again, an example from Vermont, and this is across the country, different exemptions. OSHA cannot legally go inspect a farm unless they have 10 or more workers. All the farms that I worked in, auditing them for the, the Milk with Dignity program, had five or less workers. And that did not mean, right? Like what they're saying with that is that if there's 10 or less workers, then it's not worth inspecting them. It's not worth caring for their lives. The only way that OSHA can go into a workplace that has more, less than 10 workers is if there's a fatality. So if somebody dies in that workplace, then OSHA can go see how that person died, but there's nothing around prevention. On top of excluding from certain labor rights or being excluded from certain labor rights, you have a lack of enforcement and auditing on the part of the government. To give you some numbers, OSHA has 1,850 inspectors for 130 million workers in the US. So that means that for every one officer, they are in charge of 70,000 workers' lives in the country. This still, again, does not address the need for protection from retaliation for workers, especially when we are talking about a workforce that might fear deportation. So in a world where you know OSHA does have the amount of workers uh, that it needs to inspect all these workplaces, we need to think critically as to who these workers trust, who are they gonna speak to? And how are they being guaranteed the protection from retaliation? The, the one that Lupus spoke about, the protection from you know, not being fired if they speak about the conditions on, on a farm or in a workplace. Lastly, uh, the government, these government protections, you know, these laws that exist to protect workers, even with an Im implementation of worker protection from retaliation, let's say somehow we could magically wave that wand and protect workers from retaliation. It does not actually address what I think Fati started with of that economic pressure that corporations put on employers. 
the power that corporations have in dictating the price of a product is unmatched by the power that government has to regulate any of this. And so that is why the WSR model critically addresses all these loopholes in other solutions. I'm just watching Patti to make sure that she can finish. <laughs> okay. So, you know, what, sell, what sets the model apart? As you heard from Patti, you heard from Lupe, these are critical essential elements that that's what we call them. And it's not a menu to choose from, you know, when, when corporations are negotiating with the coalition of Immokalee workers, or when in the future, corporations are negotiating with another group of workers who are implementing this model. The table is not about which of these elements can you implement. It, it's about saying these are essential elements. It's not a menu. And all of them work together to create the kind of powerful program that um, Lupe has been talking about. And so I'll quickly run through them. I know you've heard them in, in sort of different ways as, 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 Lu as Lupe has shared the experience of the workers in Immokalee, but there has to be a worker authored labor standards, right? That means that that code of conduct, that code that farms are gonna be, or any workplace is gonna be audited to be compliant with needs to come from workers. Why? Because workers, are the ones that know what abuses are happening on the ground, regardless of, of, of what the workplace is, right? Um, currently I work, as part of the network, I work with construction workers, I work with poultry workers, I work with folks that are in factories. So it doesn't, you know, think beyond the tomato field. Uh, workers know the changes that they need on the ground. So that's the labor standards created, authored by workers. The worker to worker education, critical, right? If we don't know our rights, how will we call that support line and say, hey, somebody's violating my right? And, you know, you can say, okay, well, you can print a copy of the code, give it out to every worker in the workplace, but you're not really engaging workers. You're not really building the trust of saying, I'm a worker and I'm sharing live in person the rights that you have under this program. And you can ask me questions about it after and it'll be given in your language. And it's a, yeah, it's a human interaction in that worker to worker education. The third piece, the legally binding agreement, that means that Taco Bell, Ben and Jerry's, which is the ice cream company that signed the Milk with Dignity Agreement are legally committing themselves to all of these elements that they are not able to say, oh, but I love that farmer and their tomatoes. And even if they're not complying with the code, can we make an exception to keep them in the program? No, that means that the, the, the corporation is committing the sems, themselves legally to allowing that third party monitor, that Fair Food Standards Council, that Milk with Dignity Standards Council to say, hey, your supplier, is not complying with the code. They are not doing the things that we told them they needed to do. They're not changing the things that they needed to change. So you need to kick them out of your supply chain. That market power is what makes suppliers comply, right? This isn't volunteer, voluntary. A, 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 a supplier cannot say, well, good. I'm glad you're telling me now that there are issues in the fields. I don't really feel like changing them. I, I can't. That is not a, 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 an option. They either change or they leave that supply chain. Uh, the financial incentive to comply. I sort of talked about this in my last slide at the end. Companies and corporations have put pressure on farmers and thus then farm workers. And so, you know, that penny per pound is one way of, of alleviating that and not saying to a farmer, hey, now you need to raise wages of farm workers in the fields, but rather, hey, corporation, you have more money than everyone else in this, in this supply chain. You need to give directly more money to workers. In the Milk with Dignity program, the way that that uh, you know, financial incentive works is that Ben & Jerry's gives farmers a premium, a monthly premium 
to help them economically to, do, to implement the code. So if the code says, hey, you now have to give workers Vermont minimum wage, not federal minimum wage, then that premium is, to, is supposed to offset the cost of compliance. Independent monitoring, we talked about it, the Fair Food Standards Council, the Milk with Dignity Standards Council. These are people that don't helicopter in once a year and say, hey, uh, worker, how, how are conditions? Let me do a checklist. No, 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 no. It's deep interviews. Um, with, you know, in, in Vermont, these interviews are one to two hour interviews per worker, talking to them about the conditions. There's also that support line 24 hours and not, it's not just because, and let me pause here about the 24 hour line to say that the line is not just, you know, a hotline like any other, but rather it's, it reflects that we believe that workers are the best monitors, the best auditors, right? And that they are the ones that can say today, that code is not being um, complied with. Tomorrow it might be fine. Maybe tomorrow when the auditors come, th they're complying with the code, but today they're not. And so that's the power that we wanna give workers to call and say, hey, there's issues today on the ground, uh, 365 days um, a year. Uh, lastly, the consequences, I already talked about them, that you know, if, if a supplier does not wanna comply with the code, does not wanna change things on the ground, then they are kicked out of that supply chain. Um, let me see. Okay, so how I know that I was asked to speak, you know, a little bit about corporate social responsibility, multi-stakeholder multi -stakeholder initiatives and how these other, you know, quote unquote solutions have failed workers. Um, after continuously exposing and shaming corporations, what happened, you know, how MSIs were created is that civil society organizations were invited to be a part of that conversation. MSIs began working alongside businesses to draft codes of conduct, to create oversight mechanisms, to design systems for multi-stakeholder governance that aim to protect the rights of workers and benefit those communities. And, you know, I'm gonna go back a little and explain what a MSI is in case some, some of you don't know what a multi-stakeholder initiative is. That's a group of interested parties, right? So you have the government, you have maybe a representative of the government, a representative of that civil society organization, and then you have representatives of the corporation all sitting at that same table, thinking of solutions of how to, you know, eradicate human rights abuses from their supply chain. And so this, this experiment of multi-stakeholder initiatives began maybe three decades ago. Um, and the research has shown that MSIs have, are, have not been effective tools for holding corporations accountable. They are important and necessary venues for learning, for dialogue, for building trust between communities and corporations, but they cannot be relied upon to protect the rights of workers. Um, MSIs are top-down approaches to addressing human rights concerns, and thus they fail to center the needs and voices of workers. Um, I will share some uh, some of the resources that I've read on multi-stakeholder initiatives and corporate social responsibility that highlight the specific flaws in these systems. But like I said, centering workers is, is the essential part of our model. And I think the most critical part in why it's so effective. Um, let me see. Um, okay, and so, you know, I think I, I'm gonna end my conversation about MSIs and why they fail in the fact that MSIs are not legally binding, right? They are voluntary. So this means that, you know, you can achieve positive outcomes where there's a genuine commitment from the corporation to change their supply chain. But if there's no, when, when that goodwill breaks down, as it often does with corporations, once you know that, 
um, headline is, is done with, once the public is not paying attention to it, then MSIs have, have little power to actually protect those rights of, of workers. Um, I will now pass the voice or the microphone back to Lupe to talk about the current work uh, and the current boycott against Wendy's and then we'll go to questions. So I should put you back. Gracias, as an... uh, Rafaela. Oh, wait, Gracias, Pati, por traducir. Wait. Un segundo, wait. un okay. segundo, Lupe. Eh, um, Carol, you should just disable interpretation because what we will do oh, for this right. piece okay. is that Lupe is going to speak and I'll speak after her. So we'll do oh, consecutive. Wonderful. Okay. Yes. Good. Dale, Lupe. Pues gracias, Rafaela y Patti, por eh, traducir ahí. Eh, pues sí, ahorita como eh, la campaña que tenemos es eh, el boicot con Wendy's. So thank you, uh, Rafaela and Patti, for interpreting. And now I will talk about the boycott we currently have against Wendy's. Y tenemos ya más de siete años que empezamos esta campaña con Wendy's y hasta ahorita pues se ha negado a ser parte de este programa. We have over seven years campaigning against Wendy's and they've continued to, you know, uh, not sign the, into the Fair Food Program. Y pues continuamos las campañas porque es urgente, ¿verdad? Seguir expandiendo este programa ya que miles de trabajadores siguen eh, viviendo en diferentes situaciones de abuso. So for us, it is urgent to continue this campaign. It is urgent to expand the program because there are thousands of workers who are dealing with the day-to-day -day abuses that I talked about. Y Wendy, en lugar de ayudar a expandir este programa, pues solamente ha puesto excusas de no querer unirse al programa. Instead of joining the program, Wendy has just continued to give excuse upon excuse as to why they, they won't join the program. Y básicamente han dicho que ellos, bueno, al principio eh, estaban diciendo que ellos compraban sus tomates en Florida posiblemente en ranchos que estaban dentro del programa de comida justa, pero realmente como no hay una transparencia de compra, nosotros no sabíamos exactamente dónde ellos estaban comprando, pero seguramente no estaban haciendo nada para proteger los derechos humanos de los trabajadores. And so, you know, the first excuse was saying, yes, we buy Florida tomatoes and they actually already come from uh, Fair Food Program farms. But the reality is that without, you know, them being transparent about where they source from, that, you know, that is not something that they can actually claim. Y después ellos dijeron que ya no estaban comprando sus tomates en Florida, que estaban trayendo sus tomates de México. Y pues lastimosamente en México no hay un programa para proteger a los trabajadores. Entonces se viven diferentes situaciones también bastante fuertes en esa industria. And then they said, you know, that they changed their sourcing, that they were now sourcing their tomatoes from Mexico. And unfortunately, you know, there aren't any protections in Mexico for them, as well as, you know, the same abuses or even worse abuses were happening in those fields. Hace como tres años, más o menos, ellos dijeron que ya no estaban comprando sus tomates en México, que ahora habían movido la mayoría de sus compras a Estados Unidos y Canadá en los invernaderos. And then three years ago, you know, they said, actually, we're no longer buying tomatoes from Mexico. We're now back to buying them from the U.S. and Canada, but now we buy them from uh, green, their greenhouse tomatoes. Y pues ellos dijeron, pues los trabajadores en los invernaderos tienen sombra, entonces no hay otras necesidades. And so they said, you know, the, the workers working in the greenhouses, they have shade. So, you know, what's the point of, of joining the program? We don't need to join the program anymore. Entonces, para uno como trabajador tener sombra está bien, pero eso no soluciona los problemas de derechos humanos. Por ejemplo, ¿Qué pasa con el acoso sexual? ¿Qué pasa con el robo de salario? ¿Qué pasa eh, cuando un trabajador está siendo despedido por eh, reportar algún tipo de abuso? O sea, que el trabajador al final del día no tiene protecciones. And so, yes, okay, shade is good. Shade is something that workers need, but 
what about a solution to the rest of the human rights abuses that happen? You know, what about a solution uh, to sexual harassment, to wage theft, to being fired when you speak up? Entonces, eh, también ellos eh, están diciendo que tienen su propio código de conducta, que tienen sus propios auditores, que como se estaba mencionando anteriormente, es algo voluntario. Nadie está asegurando que se está cumpliendo y no existe la voz del trabajador. Entonces, esa es la razón por qué ahora nosotros tenemos este boicot. Uh. Hold on, Lu perdón, Lupe, es que me entró una llamada y me sacó de onda a mi compu y me sacó también de la presentación. Entonces, déjame primero. Uh, sorry, everyone, I got a call and I couldn't. So it like, you know, took me out of the presentation and then I stopped paying attention. One second. Um, ok. Uh, Lupe, ¿puedes repetir esa última parte que dijiste? Perdóname. Sí, que esa es eh, como lo que Wendy este, también dice, es que tiene su propio eh, mm, código, código de conducta y su, sus, moni sus auditores que son voluntarios. And so they've also said, you know, we do have a code, we have auditors, but it's, you know, all volunteer. Entonces, pues es la razón que tenemos ahorita eh, la campaña con Wendy, y pues eh, tenemos eh, ahorita la semana de acción en donde estamos pidiendo pues que los consumidores, aún como si ustedes no consumen en Wendy's, pero traer más gente, Wendy se va a dar cuenta de que la presión es fuerte. Entonces, unirse a esta, a esta campaña y pues eh, les vamos a compartir la información para que ustedes pueden aprender más del boicot. And so this week is our week of action against Wendy's. Uh, and you know, even if you don't buy Wendy's, it's still important to have as many people participate as possible. We will share this link with you all. And uh, basically I'm adding this piece. <laughs> um, the, the actions that are happening every day Be, besides the one that we're going to later talk about that is in person, are one minute action. So it's just signing up on this link and then doing a one minute email call. It, it's super quick and super easy sort of to get involved and get engaged. Y pues también tenemos otra acción. Y no sé, Patti, si quieres hablar un poquito de los detalles de esa acción que se va a tener en Nueva York. Ojalá que puedan también eh, participar e invitar a más personas. And so the, the other action that is happening in person is um, in New York City uh, on Thursday. And I will also add that the reason why this is important, right? Try and partners is that that is where Nelson Pelt's offices are and he is a board member of Wendy's. And so that's why it's important in a critical sort of location of folks that can make decisions for Wendy's. And um, Lupe also asked Patti to kind of chime in a little on, uh, around this action. Yeah, Lupe asked me to chime in because uh, there's a New York-based group called New York Fair Food. Um, there's like ones like these across the country in various cities, and they support the CIW um, in actions like this and amplifying the campaign. And New York Fair Food um, is organizing this action on Thursday. Um, the details are there. It's going to be just honestly like a 15 minute walk from the Graduate Center. So if you're already on the Graduate Center on Thursdays, you should definitely come and join in. Okay. Y estas son las redes sociales donde pueden seguir eh, la campaña. Eh, cada día estamos poniendo cosas que se pueden hacer ahí. Entonces eh, pueden seguirnos y creo que vamos a las preguntas. So these are our different social media handles. This is where you can sort of stay up to date in what we're doing and in the different actions uh, that are happening for this campaign or others. And now we will go to questions. Okay, well, we should applaud that excellent presentation. It was really amazing. Uh, so questions, comments from anybody here? Um, Shant? Yeah. Um, yeah. 
No, th thank you very much. Um, that really is inspiring account. Oh, and sorry, before you start, just remember that I will have to interpret you. So if it's a really long question, pause, and then I'll interpret it for Lupe and then finish it. But if it's, you know, short and simple, just go for it. But I just try to tell people now so that they know that like, I'll have to like write down and oh, then yes. interpret. It's, 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 it's great. That will help. That will help give me, <laughs> help give me time to <clears throat> just tell me who I should put into the interview. Oh, no, no one. No, oh, no, no, no one. one. It's no one. Yeah, don't worry. Put her back. <laughs> who, who sent me this text, though? Someone sent me a text. Oh. All right. Maybe it was Wally. <laughs> Never mind. Okay. Shant, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it sounds like um, part of the reason that farmers were able to get away with exploiting workers is because of the loopholes that, that you described. But I'm just curious. Um, you know, do you view your work as a hundred percent grassroots? Is there, has have you ever encountered any sort of official or quasi-official efforts to to assist, whether from elected officials or even law enforcement? I mean, because the things you described were were illegal. So I was just curious about that. Um, and then the question is, do you ever what what was the word of like assist. engage and assist? Get it like work with assist from. Did yeah. you ever get okay. any assist? Okay. Uh, Lupe, la pregunta es que, o sea, obviamente muchos de los trabajadores son explotados, ¿no? Pero esos, y por los, por los rancheros. Aunque existen leyes, ¿verdad? Bueno, a veces existen leyes que protegen a los trabajadores y no hay enforzamiento y a veces no hay las leyes, ¿verdad? Para, para proteger a los trabajadores. Eh, la pregunta es primero si tú ves tu esfuerzo de, de este tipo de programa, este tipo de modelos, siempre siendo 100% como que de trabajadores hacia arriba, o si ves en algún momento como que, que este tipo de programas puede trabajar con el gobierno, con este, diferentes grupos del gobierno como la policía o diferentes este, eh, oficiales electos, este, políticos. No sé, yo hablaría también pues de los casos, por ejemplo, de esclavitud y cómo ha habido esa este, cooperación, ¿no? Uh -huh. Sí, pues siempre hay colaboración y la verdad es que se puede implementar en cual, como el modelo del programa se puede implementar en cualquier lugar de trabajo que se, que se ve que hay problemas. Eh, en cuanto a... A gobiernos eh, creo que varía bastante, ¿verdad? Porque dependiendo de la administración que hay en gobierno, a veces cambian las situaciones, ¿verdad? O hay un gobierno que sí lo quiere, otro que no lo quiere, ¿verdad? Entonces creo que depende. Pero sí, en los casos de esclavitud hemos trabajado junto con la policía, eh, junto con el Departamento de Justicia para llevar los casos de esclavitud que los trabajadores han enfrentado. Entonces, siempre hay una colaboración para poder hacer que haya justicia pues, para los trabajadores que han enfrentado casos bastante extremos. So, you know, uh, the collaboration... Well, first of all, you know, the, the, the model can be implemented in different workplaces, in different industries. The collaboration with the government, specifically politicians, varies depending on who's in, in power in that moment. Uh, there are politicians who really support the work and really want to collaborate and move it forward. And there are some who really hate it. Um, the, the case where there's been the most collaboration with uh, enforcement and government officials has been in cases of forced labor. So in those cases, then the Fair Food Program directly collaborates with the police, with the Department of Justice to bring, because it's a crime, so to bring that, you know, into, um, you know, people have been, for example, incarcerated who have been found guilty through the program and through um, the auditors to be guilty of uh, forced labor and trafficking. Does that add everything? Do you want to ask some more, something else? No, that's no, that's really interesting to hear. I mean, I think Lupe, you, you kind of already addressed this, but yeah, you mentioned support from official channels varies on the political climate. You know, all while you were speaking, I, I, I kept thinking of this really unfortunate rise in, in anti-immigrant sentiment the, the, that the country has seen the past few years. 
has that made your work harder or, or has it maybe in, helped draw attention to your cause? Este, Lupe, bueno, eh, cuando mencionas, ¿verdad?, que depende de quién está a cargo en, o en el gobierno, ¿verdad?, ha cambiado eh, la forma de colaborar con ese gobierno, eh, pues pienso también en, en, en este sentimiento antimigrante, ¿verdad?, de antimigración que ha crecido en este país. Y la pregunta es si... Si sí, con este crecimiento de este movimiento antimigrante, tú has visto que el trabajo se ha vuelto más difícil o si has visto que también pues hay más atención a este tipo de trabajo, a este tipo de movimientos y han podido usar ese, esa atención. Pues sí, la verdad es que pues también en los últimos dos años han venido bastantes trabajadores de H2A, trabajadores que vienen con una visa y sí, sigue creciendo bastante la manera de, de trabajadores viniendo y yendo. Y pues hay muchos trabajos que, de trabajadores que vienen como en caravanas, igual vienen a las labores, vienen a la construcción. Entonces sí sigue creciendo, pero lo que no está creciendo es proteger a los trabajadores y eso es... Es triste porque trabajadores vienen vulnerables, vienen con una necesidad y aceptan pues las condiciones que se les dé para trabajar. Entonces es por eso importante que este programa puede seguir expandiendo a, a otras industrias, a otros trabajadores, porque seguramente van a seguir viniendo más trabajadores y la industria seguirá igual de mal sin protecciones. So, you know, in the past two years, we've seen an increase of workers uh, coming through H-2A visas. And those are folks that are coming for a season going back. They have a legal permit to be here. Um, and I'll add that if you want an amazing paper on how H-2As are even worse than, you know, folks just coming, I can send you that. But, uh, you know, folks come through the H-2A program, a lot of increases in that. But also, like you all know, like caravans and, and folks just coming to, to work, not only in, in this industry, but in construction and other industries. And the problem, right, is that protections aren't growing for the, the workers. The, the workforce is increasing while protections are not increasing for that workforce. And I think that is why we sort of see our fight as ongoing to continue expanding and to continue protecting more and more workers as they come. Um, so yeah. I just have an, an information question, <clears throat> if I could. I'm, I'm curious how that uh, independent council is formed. Mm -hmm. uh, is it, um, you know, who appoints it? And is it, do you have joint, uh, uh, joint power from the labor side and the corporate side to constitute it? Or um, how does it constitute it? Eh, Lupe, Carol está preguntando de cómo se construye ese, o sea, el consejo, como que legalmente a quién le responde si se construye con la este, compañía o, sí, cómo es independiente. Uh -huh. Si quieres responder y si no, yo también le puedo agregar. Porque... Sí, sí puedes tú responder. No. Ok, I'm going to respond because I was part of the council. So um, I work for the uh, Milk with Dignity Standards Council. So the, the council maintains its independence in a few ways. One is its, its own 501c3, right? So it is created with the sole purpose of monitoring whether it's the Milk with Dignity program or the Fair Food program. It is, you know, created by the coalition of Immokalee workers. They say, hey, we need an independent monitor to solely work on these standards. We're not gonna hire another random, why? Because these worker organizations like Migrant Justice and the Coalition wanna maintain control as to who is monitoring, right? It needs to be folks that are in the community, folks that are there. In terms of, for example, an economic independence, the, the Standards Council needs to, does its own uh, fundraising, just like any nonprofit. And so they look for uh, grants that support their work and monitoring. And I think that is a critical separation from the company. A lot of, you know, these certifications take money from the, the companies right. to um, be supported and do their work. 
And so that is, again, another critical component of, of the Standards Council for these programs. Um, the company has really no power over the council. It, it really is like the legal world of, you know, bringing in um, a case against a, a farmer, but in a very private and independent way. So the code that um, the companies sign says that they are allowing the Standards Council to be the sole investigator and uh, fact-finding uh, body in, in their supply chain. Great. I don't know if that adds everything. I could yeah, add more if you great. have a specific question. Yeah. No, that's interesting. And I guess the other question is, what has been effective in bringing companies on board? Has it just been, how, what is the role of protests by labor? And what is the role of, is it just been consumer boycotts or is there something else in addition that has enabled it to expand? What do you think is the effective forces here? Because it's a very promising model, but I'm just curious you know, how it can be proliferated further. How do you see it developing also? Eh, la pregunta de Carol es que, bueno, o sea, el modelo es súper es eficaz, funciona, ¿verdad? Y vemos que, bueno, su pregunta es, ¿cómo, ¿cómo han traído ustedes a diferentes compañías a la mesa? ¿No? Si siempre ha sido por una protesta y un boicot, y, y de ahí pues las compañías firman, o si ha habido otras estrategias para que las compañías este, se involucren y se, se unan al, al programa, porque pues ella piensa en la expansión, ¿no? Y cómo vas a expandir tanto y tanto si, si la única estrategia es un boicot o una campaña con consumidores. Uh -huh. Sí, bueno, la mayoría han llegado por medio de, de campañas públicas, eh, por medio de protestas, delegaciones, Solamente eh, han habido dos boicotes en la historia desde el 2001 hasta ahora, que es Taco Bell y Wendy's. Entonces las otras no hemos tenido un boicot. Y como dos corporaciones, creo que Walmart y Fresh Market fueron eh, las que entraron voluntariamente. Pues se les había mandado como cartas, ¿verdad? Hubo una campaña más como de enviar carta, invitarles. Entonces... Eh, pero sí, la mayoría por medio de, de campaña con consumidores. So, you know, it's been varied. The, there's only been two boycotts. So out of the 14 companies, only two have been boycotted. Taco Bell at the beginning and now Wendy's. So those have been the only two companies that have, you know, escalated to that point. Uh, most of them have had public campaigns uh, where consumers are engaged, but there have also been, for example, Walmart and Fresh Market were uh, volunteered. So voluntary. So they they came to the coalition of Immokalee workers and said, we want to join the program. And so that's another way uh, a company can just say, we want to join and they're allowed to join. And in, in those, you know, at first there's at times like a letter that's sent to that company that says, hey, you're part of the supply chain. Do you want to join? And so it's more of a soft push um, at the beginning and it can escalate depending on the company. I'm yeah. going to also just quickly um, interpret slash translate um, Henry's chat uh, for Lupe, just because it's in English, and then we can go to Guillermo. Uh, Lupe, no sé si ves en el chat que eh, Heri, que ya se fue de la conversación, dice, gracias Lupe por traernos tu historia tan in inspirante, y gracias al centro por ayudarnos a traer este tipo de conversaciones pues en nuestro rango de de este educación. Ok, Guillermo. Pues la pregunta va directa a Lupe y la va a hacer en español. Entonces me imagino que tú le traduces eh, a los demás. Eh, sí. No, primero que nada agradecer eh, poniendo eh, igual que el comentario que acaba de leer Rafaela. Eh, eco todo, todo, todos esos buenos comentarios, muy inspiradora la historia y pues bueno, voy a, voy a hablar con Patricia y con el, con el grupo para, para seguir en comunicación si no es necesariamente en tiempo o en, en estar en, en, en el boicot porque voy a estar en el trabajo, veo cómo me involucro también financieramente, etcétera, etcétera. 
Eh, pero bueno, la pregunta. Mi pregunta es. I'm just doing it via the text so that people can just read how I'm um, uh, translating wow. what you're saying. <laughs> wow, perfecto. La pregunta es. Eh, tengo curiosidad, ¿cuál es el rol del ranchero en, el, en este incentivo económico que están ustedes buscando con las corporaciones? Porque lo que escuché yo es que el, el, el bono por, por producto producido se paga directo del, de la compañía. Y en realidad el, el, el ranchero lo único que le estamos dando y asignando responsabilidad pues es de que los vamos a tener, va a haber este, este modo que el trabajador va a poder hablar, va a poder este, poner quejas y, 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 y no tener miedo al des, a, a que lo despidan. Pero mi pregunta es, ¿el ranchero tiene que pagar y no tiene que ser también incentivizado económicamente porque a fin de cuentas, en, en la, como funciona la estructura hoy en el capitalismo, es que para la compañía, a fin de cuentas, ¿quién es el que tiene más, quién está más involucrado en determinar el precio del producto? Pero si a fin de cuentas el ranchero exige un producto a la compañía, bueno, igual si eso afecta, si eso afecta o podría atraer este, a más compañías que no sé si necesariamente no quieran pagar directo al trabajador o si hay un intermediario. Quiero ver cuál es el rol del ranchero en esta dinámica que estamos tratando de, de, de establecer. Dame, dame un segundo, Lupe, para terminar de este, uh, traducir la pregunta. You're going to translate for us, right, Rafaela? Or, I'm just I can, doing I it in actually, the, I can yeah, actually translate. Yeah, yeah, I started it, but yeah. I started in the chat, Carol. So yeah, like, we got that. I see. Okay. Yeah, I think just the last just piece, Guillermo. Yes. I'm just saying, Rafael, if you need me to step in, just let me know. Oh um, no, it's fine. Yeah, I think Guillermo knows the best with the last English. piece. He, he speaks great English. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll translate. So but I'm, I, I'm just... I, I just got to that part of just saying like the economic incentive. Yeah, Peace. I, I'm trying to understand what the role of the rancher of the employer is in uh, in the in this incentive structure or in, in compensating the workers accordingly. It sounds like because the corporation is the one that has the most critical weight in determining prices or or, you know, they're just larger in general. That's who we're targeting. I'm, I'm trying to understand if the ranchers themselves should also be held accountable economically, yeah, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in that sense, I'm not sure if some opposition, probably qualitatively from, the, from, from corporations would be, well, I mean, your, your, your employer should be paying you for, for, for the production, et cetera. It creates more of a friction or, or potentially uh, complicates the process. So I, I want to try to hold the, the, the employer accountable uh, here. So, so that, that was a question. Sí, bueno, el ranchero tiene, por ejemplo, si, como se mencionó anteriormente, creo que Rafaela lo mencionó, que si ellos no cumplen con el código de conducta, por ejemplo, la responsabilidad de ellos es asegurar que los derechos estén cumpliendo dentro de su rancho. Si hay un contratista que no está cumpliendo y no quiere cumplir con el código de conducta, el ranchero habla con él y le dice, si tú no te, como te alineas, digamos, voy a tener que despedirte porque hay consecuencias de mercado. Si el ranchero no está limpiando eh, los abusos en su rancho, lo, las corporaciones ya no van a comprar en su rancho. Pero si ellos están cumpliendo con ese código de conducta, tienen garantizada la venta de su producción. Como ellos no van a estar buscando mercado, ellos ya saben que estas corporaciones van a comprar los productos que ellos están sacando cada temporada. Ok, so, you know, if farmers, if they have the responsibility, they still have the main responsibility of making sure that that code is being honored on the farm. And so, for example, 
if um, a subcontractor or a crew leader is violating one of those uh, rights under the code, then it's up to the farmer. The farmer needs to say, hey, crew leader, you need to stop doing this or you need to stop doing that. They still are the ones that are directing the rest of their, you know, um, they're still managing their farm. Um, and so, you know, the farmer still has the responsibility of, for example, having to fire a manager if, if they commit some sort of violation that requires that. And there's the, the consequence for the farmer if, if they don't comply with that code is that they lose that uh, market access. And so that brand is saying, if that uh, farmer does not comply with the code, then we will not guarantee that we can purchase um, their tomatoes. Uh, Lupe, voy a agregar algo, está bien? Sí. ¿O quieres seguir? Sí, no, nada más, más. Nada más, sí, agregar un poco más como también los rancheros eh, ahorita, por ejemplo, desde que empezó el programa, ellos han, están pagando un poquito más al, al precio de la cubeta que los trabajadores ganan. Por ejemplo, los trabajadores eh, estaban ganando 45 centavos la cubeta por una cubeta que pesa 32 libras. ¿Verdad? Ahorita ya lo están pagando en 65 o 70 centavos. Le han aumentado el salario a los trabajadores. So farmers have also uh, increased uh, and paid for this increase of how much they pay per bucket. Uh, it used to be that that bucket, they would pay 45 cents per bucket uh, for 30. And that bucket contains about 32 pounds of tomatoes. And now they pay 65 to 70 cents. And I just want to make that as a pause to think of 32 pounds of tomatoes picked. Wow. A farmer earns now, right, on a good day, 70 cents per 35 pounds of tomatoes picked. Um, y, y aparte so, de... So, eh, perdón, Lupe, es que les estaba diciendo que como que se pusieran a pensar okay. en, en, en lo que es ganar 70 centavos por 32 libras, ¿no? Cuando ven tal vez en el, en el supermercado cuánto pagan por libra, ¿no? Uh -huh. Y okay. pues ahorita los trabajadores están registrados directamente con la compañía. Cada rancho tiene que tener registrado al trabajador y eso es para garantizar el salario mínimo. Si un trabajador, por ejemplo, trabajando por cubeta no logró sacar el salario mínimo al final de la semana, el trabajador le de, el ranchero, perdón, le debe de pagar al trabajador lo que pasó, las horas que pasó dentro del rancho. Esa es otra responsabilidad y así el trabajador al final de la semana tiene garantizado un salario mínimo que le va a ayudar a poder tener una vida pues poco más digna. So another uh, critical component that the program brings to the ground is that workers need to be directly hired by the farm. There has there doesn't there can't be like a subcontractor, and that also means that farmers are responsible to pay minimum wage to farmers. So if a farm worker does not get to the minimum wage in a day, uh, by pick, just by the uh, piece rate of the buckets then they are to be paid uh, that minimum wage, that hourly minimum wage. And so that guarantees, you know, a dignified life. Um, that is also something that is um, added to the program. And I would say, Guillermo, to add, voy a agregar mi parte, Lupe, está bien? Mm -hmm. Of the economic uh, sort of forces at play here is that, and I don't know if this is what you were saying, but the program believes that the companies dictate and are, yes, the, the employer is the one not paying, right? Or, or actually doing the wage theft or, or the manager is the one sexually harassing the worker. And I'm not excusing any of that, but what I'm saying is that that corporation at the top is the one saying to the farm owner, I will pay you, you know, 20 cents per bucket, no more than that. And you can either, you know, buy, sell your tomato somewhere else, or I will buy all of them for 20 cents per bucket, let's say. And so that is why, you know, another piece that we've not talked about, because again, the, 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 the kind of details of the programs will take, you know, another two hours to explain, but both the fair food program and they work differently and the milk with dignity program 
in the fair food program, there's uh, the company pays the farm for like payroll, the, the payroll to do all these different changes, right? The, the additional minimum wage, the penny per pound pass through, all of those things the company is responsible to kind of offset the cost of that for farmers. And in Vermont and in the dairy, it's a lot bigger. Uh, it's a lot more money being sent directly to the farmer to comply. Why? Because the dairy industry is super crazy and, and farmers are getting squeezed uh, on the price of milk in all kinds of way because it's a global market. Uh, so they're competing with the, you know, milk in China, milk in Brazil, anywhere else, right? That's the price pressure. And so Ben and Jerry's directly kind of says, okay, I'm going to do my part as a corporation and pay you more for your milk instead of, you know, selling my product and, and increasing my profits. And so that's sort of another piece that I think is pretty critical in thinking about like economic power uh, at hand and at play. Interesting. Well, uh, are there any other questions? Because I think we should bring it to a close unless anyone who hasn't spoken. Uh, okay, Matt? Va haber una última pregunta. Yes, um, Matt? Yes, thank you for the great talk. I was curious when you talk about bringing in corporations, if there is anything done to build solidarity with the workers at those corporations. And at what level do you mean that, like, build solidarity like, for workers, like, in the offices of that corporation? Uh, I, I mean, they're workers, too, but I was particularly thinking, like, the sort of, like, sale, or not sales, like, mm. counter staff at the given restaurant or locations. Mm -hmm. eh, su pregunta es si, pues, la coalición ha construido esa solidaridad o esa alianza con trabajadores, por ejemplo, que están trabajando en esos restaurantes, ¿no? Si estamos hablando de tal vez Wendy's, los que están trabajando ahí, si ha, vi, si ha habido esa comunicación o ese tipo de alianza con trabajadores de estas corporaciones. Sí han habido intercambios con trabajadores, eh, especialmente los de Lucha por 15, que también tienen su, su campaña con corporaciones de comida rápida, ¿no? Porque sabemos que... No, no solo dentro de la industria donde se cosecha, sino también donde se cocina. O sea, los problemas de abuso existen en cualquier tipo de lugar de trabajo y hemos hecho, ellos, muchos de los trabajadores ahí han venido a nuestras acciones, han hablado en nuestras acciones, cuáles son los problemas que enfrentan, por ejemplo, con, con Wendy's, ¿no? Entonces, sí, han habido eh, intercambio con, con trabajadores y también eh, nosotros hablamos que cómo ellos pueden también eh, um, luchar, seguir luchando, ¿no? Y aprender nosotros de ellos, ellos de nosotros. Entonces siempre hay ese encuentro en el camino de la lucha. So we have had exchanges, um, especially with folks that are um, on the Fight for 15. And so we've, I don't know if you know the Fight for 15, but it's a fight for $15 as minimum wage for fast food workers or for everybody. But a lot of fast food workers have um, joined that, uh, that fight, that national fight. And so we know that the issues are the same in Fight for 15 or in the work that we're doing and the issues as in like the abuses are the same. Uh, so workers in, you know, at Wendy's and other fast food places have come to our actions, have kind of joined us in that solidarity for um, our, our, our own campaign. Uh, we've also exchanged um, strategies and spoken on, you know, how do we learn from each other? How do we work together to, you know, advance both of our campaigns? Okay, with that note on solidarity, <laughs> uh, I just want to thank you for such a, an enlightening and um, fascinating discussion. So thank you very much for coming.